Well, good morning. I am so glad to see you all. I have been, it's been a hard year for me. It's been extremely lonely um, not being able to be here because I, I love ministering. I love teaching. I love seeing your faces and talking to you all. And it's just been really difficult. But I want to especially say thank you to my sisters that have reached out to me often and um, just encouraged me and prayed for me. Um, thank you. And have been patient with me as well, Father. I, I have to thank my Father in heaven for, for providing me such good sisters that love me so much. And thank you. We love you. We love you so much. So um, I was able to get to my doctor last week down in Florida because I wanted him to check to see what, how my lungs have changed over the, since 2013. Um, and not all the news was good. But I feel secure that God, I feel like God wanted me to go there, that there was a reason he wanted me to see some of those things. And, and there is a new plan. He's changed some medication. I was able to get my first COVID shot. Yay. And um, so there, it is good news. Um, so I do have a, a new plan to take care of my body. And um, God is good. He provides. He provides. And in the first song that we sang, you know, it, um, one of the verses says, if we keep our eyes on him, you know, he, he's, he's, um, he's in a, and we keep our eyes on him that he's going to provide all we need and that he is everything that we need. And he does provide for us all the time. And he is so good. Um, we're going to be talking this morning about how she keeps her home. And God thinks of the family is very precious to him. The family unit is very precious. And he, he set um, certain guidelines for us to live by. And we each have a place within that home so that it, it, it's organized and it works well. Um, let me just open this up in prayer and we'll get right into it, okay? Thank you so much, Father, that this is your day. And I do thank you that is the day you have made. And I and we will rejoice in it. And we just thank you for the strength that you give us each day to be the women of God you've called us to be. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be here, that this would be you teaching and not me, that your words would come and, and, and that you're, what you have to say to the ladies this morning and to me about how to be a, a woman that keeps her home, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would change our hearts and make us to do those things that you've called us to do and that we would love that position that you've given us. And I thank you for all these things in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So a few weeks ago when I was here, um, we learned about Ruth. Ruth is very special to me. I love her. She was a brave widow and she sac who sacrificed her own well-being and prosperity to care for her mother-in-law. She left everything, her old life, and she went to a new place, right, because she wanted to be with her mother-in-law. She wanted to learn about this God that her mother-in-law served, and she wanted to be with, God, with her mother-in-law's people. Um, and God honored that. Um, if you see in Ruth 3.11, um, she was given the, the title Woman of Excellence because of that, that sacrifice that she did and that longing for God. Um, if you look at um, Ruth 3.11, um, Boaz is speaking to her and it said, um, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. I looked at that and I said, a woman of excellence. That word woman of ex ex um, excellence is translated virtuous, it's noble character, or worthy, or a woman of value. Um, you also see this very same word also used two more times in Proverbs. Once it's referenced in Proverbs 12, 4, and I'll read it for you. It says, an excellent wife is a crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. So an excellent wife. She's virtuous. She's no, of noble character. She's worthy. She's a, a woman of value. And then you also see it with the virtuous woman that we all know about in Proverbs 31 that we're like, how could anyone be so good and so perfect? But that very same word, that woman of value, that woman of excellence is found in, in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, because she's trustworthy. A woman of value is encouraging. She works diligently. She's strong. She's prepared. She's generous. She's brave. She's resourceful. She's wise and well thought of. But most importantly, she fears the Lord. If you read verse 30, it says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And my prayer for me and for all of you 
is that we would be a woman of excellence that keeps her home. Praise God. So why don't we open our books to Titus 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. Praise God. Praise God. God's word is so good and is so true, and it's balanced. To say, when I stop here on papers, I'll know that we're all there. So I'm going to start reading with verse 1. I want to get this, the whole in context, and I'm going to go right straight to verse 5. And it says, but as for you, teach what aligns with sound doctrine. So this is Paul, and he's talking to Titus. He's telling him to teach what aligns with sound doctrine. He says, for older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And the older women, likewise, like the men, are to be reverent in behavior and not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. They need to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Praise God. These women are to be reverent. The older women are to be reverent in their behavior. And as I said earlier, the word likewise in that verse, in verse three, reveals a comparison between men and women. Likewise, we're both. And I, I believe that Paul was talking to both, men and women in both of it, that we, as older men and women, we need to be teaching the younger men. We need to be teaching the younger women to be strong in the Lord and work, uh, walk with the Lord. Um, older women should live reverent lifestyles. This is dignified and worthy of honor, that we need to be Christ-like. So we, older women here in the church, we need to be Christ-like. We need to be worthy of honor. That word rever reverent comes from the Greek word meaning appropriate or suitable to the temple. This is a picture of a priestess carrying out her sacred duties with devotion and responsibility. So we as older women, we need to be working within the church and we need to be working within the lives of our, our sisters and brothers. We need to be working to, to serve them. We are a priestess. Remember what Second, um, 1 Peter 2, 9 says that we are a chosen generation that we are a royal priesthood, we are a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who calls you out of his dark, out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need to be that priestess. We need to work, as he said, carrying out sacred duties with devotion and responsibility. We need to be responsible for the younger women that are among us. We've gone through so many experiences in our life, married or not, we have gone through experiences that we can share with the younger Christian women in our lives and that we need to take that as a calling on our lives. To do that is a responsibility. Um, we need to live a life that is dignified and worthy of honor. Older Christian women should have a respectful attitude to all aspects of life toward all people of all ages. And they must not be a gossiper. If you have lots of time, I know when you get retired, I'm not there yet. I don't know when I'll ever get there, but I, I think a lot of times when we have idle time, we have a tendency to, to gossip. That's just human nature, me included, right? And it's not something that God wants. Um, but instead, we should fill our time with the Lord, right? Volunteer, right? And be loving, patient, and kind. We need to follow what 1 Corinthians 13 says. We need to bear all things, believe the best of all those around you, always being forgiving and bearing all things. We need to encourage one another and to love and good works. That's what the older women in the church really need to do. That's what we need to do as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, the, the, the statement, idle hands are the devil's workshop, is not found in the Bible, but it does have its roots there. Um, the Apostle Paul notes that those who waste time in idleness or non-productive manner are easily led to sin. Second Thessalonians 3.11 says, We hear that some among you are idle, and they are not busy, but instead they are busy buddies. Right? So let's go ahead and make sure that you keep your mind on him and that you do those things that, that he wants you to. If you have extra time, there's plenty to do here. I mean, we have threads of love. 
We have lots of different ministries that we can do here in the church um, and for each other. We can visit those in the nursing home. You know, there's, there's many things that we can do to help. And we can also reach out to those younger women in the Lord that need our, our help, that need our assessment, that need to hear what they're doing is good. Because uh, believe me, as a young mom, she's going to have loads of, of guilt heaped upon her, right? As a new wife, she's going to think everything is great and wonderful in the very beginning. And then things are going to get a little rough here and there. They are. That's just part of life. But... But God has provided us older women to be able to speak to us in that, those instances. God, and pour his word into you and to nurture you and to teach you how to be a good wife and a good mother. And to those, when Satan heaps those coals of, of, of those hot coals, burning coals upon your head, you know, that condemnation, um, the older women can, can point out how to, you should be acting as a mom how you should be acting as a wife, and that um, we do all make mistakes, but isn't that why Christ came for us, right? He came to, to help us, to redeem us. Um, Satan is also a divider. He is the divider-in-chief, and don't let yourself be used by him. You are a child of God. Keep yourself pure. So older women, keep yourself pure. Um, we need to be ministering to others. This means that we should be sharing our wisdom and our knowledge and our faith with our own family and our church family and our friends. We need to train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, and they should teach the younger to be discreet and sober-minded and temperate. They should teach the younger to be pure of heart. A Christian wife is to be true to her husband in mind and heart as well in, as in action. She should be taught to be a keeper at home this does not suggest that she can't work outside the home or that she's a prisoner. Instead, she should care for her home. I work outside my home. I've never had that opportunity to be able to n not work outside my home. Um, but still, I am told that I need to care for those things in my home. I need to make sure that things are done. My husband will give me responsibilities that I need to, to do and, and care for. I have my own place within my home still. doesn't mean you can't work outside the home. doesn't mean you're a prisoner to your home. But instead, it means that you need to care for the things about your home. Um, so to the, to the young women, you know, before we marry, we, we imagine what our married lives will be like. I know I did. And how wonderful it will be to have children and, and how blissful and happy that will be. But surprise, I know for me, it was great. And after a little while, little things start creeping in because we are human. We all sin. We are all somewhat selfish, right? And things will start to bother us. Uh, even our children, who we desired so much, will somewhat become unlovable at some point in time. We don't always see eye to eye. Major decisions can create strife if we don't follow God's plan. We need to follow our husbands to lead in our home and not take the lead. So we need to encourage him to be the leader. Men sometimes can, if you take the lead, but that's not where God wants you, sometimes men will back up and let you take that lead. God does not want you to do that. God wants him to be the leader. He wants him to take those things. You are not equipped to take a lot of these responsibilities in your day. Let him be the leader and make sure that you are talking to the Lord and that you are in the place that you need to be submissive to your husband and submissive to what the word of God says. Don't take on things that you're not supposed to take. I myself, and I'm going to point to me, I have a tendency because I like things in order and in things in control. When my husband's moving too slow in his decision process, I like to move out ahead of him. That's not where God wants us to be. Not at all. He wants the men to be the leaders in our household. Don't take the lead. You'll be unhappy because God didn't make you to have, be like that. He didn't create you to do that. He meant you to be submissive unto your husband. That is a place where you're going to be comfortable, you're going to be safe, and you're going to be in God's plan. And your children as well will be in the right order as well because they will be underneath both of you. They will be under, and they're going to feel secure. If they feel that, that not knowing what's going on in the top between mom and dad, they're going to start feeling a bit insecure. So my 
encouragement to you is submit to your husbands. And it's not always easy. It hasn't always been for me. I, I, not at all. And I'm guilty of that. But I have to remember that he is the leader in my house. And I need to do what, he's, what he's, he, wants, he thinks we should do. I need to follow what he needs, thinks he should do. And I need to trust God. Trust God to work in his heart so that if it is a wrong decision, that it gets worked out. I remember um, more than 10 years ago, I was back in Florida, and Phil and I had had some discussion in the morning, and I don't remember what it was, but he made a decision about something, and I was not happy about it. And we had quite an argument that morning. Just before he left for work, I said, I want to take this car to work. And he says, no, I want you to take my truck. Now, I was already very upset because of what had happened earlier. And he, he says, no, I don't want you to take that. And after he left, I said, heck with you. I'm going to take the vehicle I want to take. Okay. Now, I really believe God has a sense of humor in all of it. So I took that car. As I'm driving out the driveway and, and down the road, I feel there's something not quite right. <laughs> With a wheel, something's wrong because it's kind of like wobbly. I'm like, something's not wrong. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you really need to turn around, go back, put that car back and take the vehicle he told you. But I said, nope, I'm stubborn. I'm going to do what I want to do. I am mad. I didn't get my way this morning. I'm going to get my way now. So I keep going. I'm on my way to work and it's getting worse and it's getting worse and it's getting worse, right? Um, by the, uh, by the, then I finally, when I hit US-1, I get on the phone, because now I have, this is confession time. I got a problem, Phil, <laughs> and I need your help, right? Here's humility, right? Because it's getting worse. Lights are starting to go off, right? And people are starting to wave at me like there's a problem with one of your tires, and I could feel it, right? So at the last, you know, my husband said, are you going to make it? I said, like, I'm trying to make it to you. I'm trying to make it to you. And finally, I couldn't, and I had to pull into a parking lot and had to go up and leave my car. When I got out of my car, I found that I had completely walked the tire off the rim of the car. The tire was sitting rolled over there. And here I, my car is sitting on not four wheels, but three wheels, right? Anyway, um, so here I was, my husband had to come and he had to f fix it. But God is funny. I mean, even in those silly things, God has a sense of humor. He says, see, see? I mean, even in these little things, uh, listen, um, I just wanted to say, tell you that story. I thought that that was a funny, what, what had happened to me. And of course, you know, I'm still to this day, I can't live it down. Um, whenever I see the guys that Phil worked for before, they want to know, you know, what does she do? You know, to actually walk a tire off of a rim of a car, that takes a lot of work. Anyway, so... If, if the Lord is telling you and your husband is telling you, listen to him. Listen to him. Anyway. So, my friends, as we, we as older women are commanded to help the younger women to be a good wife and a good mother. New marriages or when new children come to a home, it can be very difficult. So we as older experienced women must make ourselves available to assist and encourage younger women on how to love their husbands and their children and to keep their home. Satan would love to heap coals of guilt and shame on a new wife and mom. We need to work on building her up. We need to share our experience, experiences and encourage her to seek the Lord and to stay in the word of God. So, how, so now to the young women, how do we become a woman who keeps her home? It's way more than just cleaning or cooking. So what is a woman who keeps her home? What is that woman? And I know Ashley, pretty soon, a couple of days, you'll be married. Praise God. Hallelujah. And we as women, we need to come around her and we need to help her. We need to encourage her. We need to pray for her. Each day. Each day. So number one, she obeys God's word. This is what the woman who keeps her home. She obeys God's word. But God's word must be at the center as we seek to become a woman who keeps her home. It is only in our understanding of God's word that we can come to know and develop a reverent fear of the Lord. In Matthew 4.4, 4, we read that a man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. A woman who keeps her home views time in God's word as if it was the very food that nourishes 
her body. She thinks of it as something that cannot, she cannot live a day without. Every day, get in that word. In the morning, pick up that word. Get into that word of God. Before you start anything else, before you start taking care of the kids or your husband and getting yourselves ready for work, take that time, even if it's five minutes. Put the Lord first and his word first, and God will bless you mightily, mightily. Um, she sees that the, the God's word is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. A woman who keeps her home knows that the word of God is a living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow and of discerning of the thoughts and intents of the heart. She also knows that knowing the word is... And not heeding its instruction is worthless. So be a doer of the word. When you hear it and God tells you something, do the word of God. Do what he tells you. Do it. James 1, through 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at, at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what it looks like. But whoever looks intently into a perfect law and that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Be a doer of the word. Put it first, and your marriage will good, be good. You will know what to do each day as you're caring for your children. God will give you that wisdom to know what to do. She knows that her obedience to the Lord is vital to her understanding of the word. As Jesus states in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So keep his commandments. Number two, she prays. Prayer is so important for your family. He has called us to pray fervently for our family. We need to be on our knees before God and our faces before God to pray for our family. As wives, we need to help our husbands as we're going, they're making decisions. Help him to be that leader. So we need to be on our face because the devil is going to come in and he's going to discourage him. Be that person that's on your face, fighting that war for him, putting on that armor of God every single day. Pray for your children and especially as they get older and go to school and have all these things coming at them from the world, pray for them that they could stand against the, the arrows that come flying their way. Um, a woman who keeps her home prays without ceasing. She follows Jesus' lead and retreats to a desolate pl pl place to pray. Just like Jesus did, he would leave at night and he would go and pray for hours. Be that person that prays. Um, and a woman who keeps her home handles her anxiety and stress by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. She makes her requests made known unto God. And guess what? Then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep her heart and her mind. She prays. She prays. And when suffering and burdens of this world become too much to bear, the woman who keeps her home knows that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray. For we, as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for, too deep for words. Pray, open it, put on that armor of God, go to him, allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you, go to him. The woman uh, who keeps her home acknowledges, as Mary did, what time she spent with Jesus is precious and not to be taken for granted. Remember Mary and Martha? Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She wanted to know everything. Sit at his feet. Learn about him. Learn about him. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Learn about him. She prays for her family. If I were your enemy, I'd seek to disintegrate your family totally. If I was Satan, I'd want to just tear it apart. The family is still one of the, mo the key access points of God's purposes on earth. It is very important to him. And your family is a major component of what he's doing right here where you live. We need to be down on our knees, always, daily, praying for our family. Number three, she's an active part of the body of Christ. A woman who keeps her home enjoys being an integral part of the church, and she uses the gifts the Holy Spirit gave her. She uses her gifts. She serves in the church. 
Um, you find that in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, you know, for we're all, for just for even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the bodies, members of the body, though there are many, are one body, as so is Christ. So we're all one, right? So can the body still work well if it doesn't have a hand or a foot or, a, you know, it needs all of those pieces. So be in the body. Use your gifts in the body. Serve in the body. And the woman that um, takes care of a home, she understands the meaning of Acts 2.42, which says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. The woman who keeps her home is also willing to live out the command in Galatians 6.2, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And she knows to do what's in James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that she may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person it has great power as it is working. And also she knows how to be, what you find in Titus 2, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home. She knows how to be kind and submissive to her own husband that the word of God may not be re- reviled. And... In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says, um, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. Be patient with them all. We need to be patient. We need to help those that are faint-hearted, help those that are weak among us. A woman who keeps her home seeks to live authentically and graciously among other believers. Praise God. And number four, she serves. A woman who keeps her home believes serving follows the fear of the Lord. So if you look at 1 Samuel 12, 24, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Serve the Lord and serve him faithfully. She is a woman who seeks to serve the least of these. In Matthew 25, it talks about um, when Jesus said to him, To them, he said, starting in verse 37, the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did you see, we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say unto you, to the extent that you did it to one of these little brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it for me. So serve others, care for those, go to the prisons, go to Renewal Center, go out, serve your brothers and sisters um, and those that are least among you. She loves the Lord, her, her God, with all of her heart and all of her soul and all of her mind, and she also loves her neighbor, neighbor as herself and desires to live those things out in her life every single day. Number five, she clings to the gospel. A woman who keeps her home clings to the gospel. She is a sinner simply saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. There's no magic formula, only faith in Christ creates this woman of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. She knows that Jesus' life, death, and burial, and resurrection not only saves her from eternally in hell, but it is also the sustain, it is also the sustaining grace that furthers her sanctifications. Because of this, the woman who keeps her home regularly repents of sin. She turns to the gospel and the promises of God to fight temptation and heartache. She believes that God's grace is transformative. And as she clings to the power of Jesus' blood, she becomes clothed with strength, with dignity, and she laughs at the days to come when she'll see Jesus face to face. She speaks with wisdom and is in faithful, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. I'm going to just read for you some of Proverbs 31. Uh, Proverbs 31, so that those that want to follow, they can, starting in verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household, and eateth not of the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband also, and he shall praise her. 
Praise God. That is a woman that keeps her home and keeps it well. This woman who keeps her home clings to the gospel. She fears the Lord. She sees the depth of her sin and how it is covered with an ocean of unmerited grace. And with that leads to her joyful praise. Praise God. Now, these also, I mean, we've been talking about married women mostly, but I'm going to speak to the single women that are here too because it does apply to you as well, right? The church is your family, and God wants you to serve the family of God. Don't just think it's for women that are married. This is for you as well. If you're single, he wants you to serve the family of God. He wants to serve in your church. Obeying God's word and submitting herself to the leadership. We need to submit. We don't have a husband, but we do have a pastor and we do have elders. We need to submit to their authority and go to them for guidance when we have questions. We need to be praying for the body of Christ. We need to be praying continually for him, for, for our family in Christ. She's also an active part of the body. We need to be serving. This is not just for women that are married. We need to be serving the body of Christ. She serves her church body, and she also clings to the gospel. God's called us to be women of God. She's called, it's called us to take care of one another, and we need to esteem each other highly. And praise God that we have a God that loves us, that is kind and loving, and that he's given each of us friends. I have friends here that I can lean on, that I can depend on to come to me. Make sure you have those friends and go to the Lord for those. And actually, I'm going to encourage you, come to me, come to any of us. You need anything or any other women that are married, you know, reach out. We've been there. We've, we know how hard it can be. But trust God. He'll, he will provide for us. Well, that's all I have for this morning. Let me just close us in prayer. Thank you so much, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your word so that we would have a light to know how to live our lives. And Father, I just pray that you would just help us to be the women, the women that cares for our home, whether we're a widow and we're, we're looking out for those that are younger among us, or we're a woman that is, has an active family that we're trying to seek the Lord and know what's best for them, that you would help us also to, to keep our home and to do it well. Or for a single woman, Father, that you would help us, those women as well, Father, that they would, they would keep the church's home, that they would be in the church's home, and that they would be on the authority of Pastor Randy and of the elders, and that, Father God, that they would be able to serve as well. And I thank you, Lord, for... Um, for your word. I thank you for your grace, and I pray that we would be that woman of God you called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.